Yeah, I mean, I never thought I'd be, like, looking back at that, I never thought I'd be able to actually be watching it again. I thought those moments then were the last, you know, that's why I waved goodbye. And... Imagine spiraling toward the Earth, completely out of control, the ground racing up at hundreds of miles per hour. That's exactly where Michael Holmes found himself on one fateful day in December 2006. Both his main and reserve parachutes had failed, leaving him in a high-altitude freefall with nothing to slow his descent. In that split second, with his life flashing before him, Michael could only manage a haunting, simple farewell into his helmet camera. But what happened next was nothing short of a miracle. So, what went down in those heart-stopping seconds? And how did Michael Holmes survive the impossible? Today we dive into the untold story of the skydiver who fell 15,000 feet from the heavens and lived to tell the tale. From an early age, Michael had a fierce passion for adrenaline sports within him as he grew up on the windswept shores of Jersey in the Channel Islands. With a father who was a police surgeon, the young boy was always encouraged to chase his wild dreams, and he took the plunge into the world of skydiving at the young age of 15. By the age of 19, he had already racked up an astounding 1,000 jumps, competing in high-stakes events that pushed him to his limits. After a brief stint working with computers post-college, he packed up his gear and headed to Lake Taupo, New Zealand in December 2006. At just 25 years old, he was ready to turn his skydiving passion into a career. But little did he know, this leap would change everything. It's difficult to imagine he'd ever get stuck in a situation like this, considering that day started off as usual. Michael instructed a group of trainees who took off in bright sunshine from the airbase. There were 16 people on the plane, the usual mix of students and instructors. The jump began like any other. Michael and two friends, Jonathan King and another experienced skydiver, leapt out of the plane from 12,000 feet. They were supposed to enjoy a free fall, then safely deploy their parachutes as they'd done countless times before. It was a routine jump from 15,000 feet, about a minute's free fall before opening his main canopy, when the altimeter showed 5,000 feet. But when he pulled the ripcord, he could immediately tell that something was wrong. Usually you get yanked upright and look up to see the parachute canopy above you, but this time, Michael was just spinning uncontrollably as the parachute hadn't opened. At first, he didn't think it was a big deal. That's why skydivers open at 5,000 feet. It gives them time to sort things out, to untwist the lines, or whatever else might go wrong. But if you look at the footage, it shows that he spent a shocking 46 seconds trying to free the main parachute, reaching behind to untangle the fine cords between the harness and the canopy. It was a maneuver he'd successfully completed countless times before, but this time, nothing was working. Still, Michael claimed he wasn't too worried at first since he had a cutaway cable, a cord that allows you to detach the main canopy so you can deploy your reserve chute instead. This situation had happened to him seven times before in his 7,000 jumps, and countless others around the world have experienced it. The system was designed to be very safe, and he had complete faith in it. He thought it would be a fun thrill, Going back into freefall was an exhilarating experience before opening the reserve chute. The only annoyance at that moment was knowing he'd have to search for his main parachute later in a forest, which would cost a staggering 1,600 pounds. As he pulled the cutaway at 3,500 feet, nothing happened. In that split second, chaos erupted in his mind. The lines were snagged, and the main canopy was still tethered to him. Initially, he suspected that his clothing might be the culprit. Wearing a hooded top that day, he believed the hood could be the issue, so for a few seconds, he reached behind him, desperately trying to clear it. But it wasn't that. The cord seemed to be tangled in part of the parachute container on his back. The odds of that happening? One in a million, Michael said. We carry a small knife in case we need to cut the parachute lines, but there was no way I could reach mine. I was spinning out of control, like a rag doll in the air, almost blacking out from the force. He knew that deploying the reserve chute into the tangled mess could slow him down just enough so he wouldn't die on impact, but it could also make things worse if it got wrapped around the main chute, reducing the drag and sending him down even faster. At around 700 feet, only 7 seconds from impact, he had no choice left but to pull the reserve cord. That was his last hope, 
He'd waited as long as possible so that if it didn't work, Michael wouldn't have too much time to speed up even more, but nothing changed. So at that point he thought, well, I've got my camera, so I'll wave goodbye. There was nothing left for me to do. The video shows that at 550 feet, just five and a half seconds from the ground, the veteran skydiver gave a final wave. As the ground approached, everything seemed to speed up. The ground was rushing up, and it was just a matter of waiting for the impact. Michael tried to think of something meaningful to say to the camera, but when he glanced at the ground again, he could only blurt out, oh shoot, I'm dead, bye. People have often asked him if he saw a white light or his life flashing before his eyes in those final moments, but there was nothing like that. By then, he'd hit terminal velocity in free fall, around 120 miles per hour, but the drag from the parachute had slowed the impact to about 80 miles per hour. Michael mentioned that he knew exactly what that kind of impact could do. My father, who's a police surgeon, used to describe high-impact accidents, so I had a pretty good idea of what to expect. While free-falling above Lake Taupo, he did hold on to a small hope of landing in the water. But Mike later admitted that the rational part of him knew even water wouldn't guarantee survival. At best, he'd be unconscious and could have even drowned. As he plummeted, spinning wildly from the intense G-force, he was on the verge of blacking out and had no control over his landing. But, unknown to him, just past the airfield and near the shoreline of Five Mile Bay lay a six-foot thicket of brambles and dense, wild shrubs. Even if he had known about it, he was spinning too fast in freefall to steer himself. But, in a split second, Mikey crashed into the tangled branches, which miraculously broke his fall just enough to save his life. Nothing can quite prepare you for what the footage reveals. Shot from Michael Holmes' own helmet camera, the video captures every raw second of his terrifying descent. At first, it's just another jump for this seasoned skydiver, free-falling through the clouds from 12,000 feet. But when Michael pulls his ripcord, nothing. The parachute simply refuses to deploy. Spinning out of control, his body twists wildly in the air. And while he frantically tries to pull free his main chute, then his reserve chute, fate deals him a brutal hand. With just 550 feet between him and impact, he gives one final haunting wave to the camera. It's a silent goodbye, a scream lost to the wind as he plummets toward the earth. Moments later, the camera goes black, capturing the sickening sound of impact. The video is a tough watch, so you can imagine the ordeal fellow skydiver Jonathan King must have been going through since he jumped from the same plane, witnessing the entire fall from the sky above. From his vantage point 100 feet above, Jonathan watched in horror. Convinced his friend hadn't survived the fall, the sickening thud echoed in his ears, and as a paramedic trainee, he knew finding Mikey in the dense underbrush would be nearly impossible without his exact position. Despite his doubts, Jonathan sprinted to help, aware that every second counted. When he reached Mikey, who was drifting in and out of consciousness, Jonathan pinched his cheek, reviving him just in time. Helmet cameras recorded the entire dramatic rescue, and soon, a helicopter whisked Mikey away to Waikato Hospital. Even with a collapsed lung and shattered ankle, Mikey cracked jokes, proving that he wasn't done yet. Michael was rushed to the hospital, where he was treated for his injuries. Amazingly, his recovery took just 11 days in the hospital. Doctors were shocked. Falling from such a height, most people wouldn't have had any chance of survival. Yet Michael defied the odds thanks to a combination of luck, nature, and sheer resilience. He underwent surgery on his shattered ankle, but his life was intact. It's one thing to be physically resilient, but the mental recovery from an ordeal like this is a whole other challenge. Michael Holmes survived a 15,000 feet fall and walked with a punctured lung, a broken ankle, and an incredible story. Now, here's where the story takes another surprising twist. You might think that an experience like this would be enough to make anyone give up skydiving forever, but not Michael. Just months after his accident, he was back at the drop zone, determined to keep doing what he loved. As he sat down for an interview a year after the incident, the only thing the skydiver could say was, I should be dead, absolutely. I had certainly given up hope. After all, Michael himself had given countless safety lessons to young divers. He knew the ins and outs of a jump like this and the danger it brings. Yet, despite the world being against him, Michael still managed to walk away from the drop. For Mike, the close call was a reminder of the importance of precise training, especially given the low incidence of accidents caused by equipment failure. 
Yet, even the scariest situation possible couldn't deter him from returning to the skies and, to this day, Michael follows his passions thousands of feet above solid ground. So, what do you think? Is the adrenaline rush of skydiving worth the life-threatening risks involved? And how do you think Mikey's experience might change the way instructors approach safety measures in the future? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe before leaving.